After your humorous and somewhat surreal encounters with the opinionated French bush and the melodramatic daisy, you continue on your journey leaving behind the chaos of flora. The path ahead is clear, and you soon find yourselves approaching a gentle hill, the crest of which offers a promising view. As you ascend the hill, the landscape opens up before you, revealing Clearbrook Farm in the distance. The farm is a flurry of activity. You can see the mill's wheel turning. Workers dot the fields and the yard, tending to crops and livestock, their movements rhythmic and purposeful. As you draw nearer, you notice Garland, the farm's overseer, in the midst of his duties. His sharp eyes catch your approach, and a broad smile breaks across his weathered face. He raises a hand in greeting and starts making his way towards you, his pace quick and eager. Garland's familiar figure becomes clearer as he closes the distance. He's dressed in his usual farm attire, practical and worn, marked by the signs of a day's hard work. His wave is hearty, and his call rings out over the fields, carrying a warm welcome. Hey, Garland, how's things going, buddy? Going good, thanks, Tronald. We've just made a big purchase of new livestock from White Willow, you know, halfway between here and Waterdeep. Got some fine sheep and cows coming in. They're really going to help boost the farm's production. It's been busy, but it's the good kind of busy, you know. Well, that's neat. I'm glad you're getting back on your feet. Um, White Willow? We haven't come across that yet, have we? No, we missed it out entirely. We boarded the ship, didn't we? Rather than following the main highways. And that's just before you arrived at my temple, right? Yeah. Well, anyway, Harland, we just wanted to drop by and let you know that the goblin situation has been taken care of. They will no longer bother you. In fact, quite the contrary to it. If you needed extra hands around the farm, competent, hard workers, there are many fine goblins and ogres that would be more than willing to assist for payment, of course, but if you needed the help, it's available now. Garland's eyebrows shoot up in surprise at your news, Tronald, a mix of shock and curiosity playing across his face. He pauses for a moment, absorbing the unexpected turn of events. I don't know how you managed it, Tronald, uh, but I'm mighty glad to hear it. The goblins and ogres working with us, huh? Now that's something I never thought I'd consider, but it sounds like a real solution to some of our challenges here. He scratches his chin thoughtfully, clearly warming up to the idea. Especially for transporting our goods to market. Having a few extra hands, or rather, a few tough ones for protection on the open roads, could really change the game for us. Who would I need to speak to about setting something like this up? I mean, if these goblins and ogres are as competent and hardworking as you say, this could be a beneficial arrangement for everyone involved. Plus... It'd make the routes through the wilds a lot safer with them around, wouldn't it? Well, that was my thinking. No bandits or thieves would even consider making a move with a few of them around. You'd want to speak to either an ogre named Grizzletooth. He's a real interesting fella, strong as they come. Or Gaba. You remember Gaba, right? Well, he's the new goblin chief now. So, yeah, either one of them. Well, thanks for that, Tronald. You know, that sounds like a solid plan. It's good to know we've got some strong allies to call on if needed. Speaking of help, are you and your crew planning to stay the night? You're more than welcome to. Our doors are always open to you, especially after everything you've done for us. It'd be our pleasure to have you. What do you say? Well, I was thinking about it, but honestly, I think it would be better if we just continued moving. We really just wanted to tell you that you're safe now. We have a fair bit of ground to cover, and we're seriously pressed for time. You see, we have to get back to Alexandru's temple because one of his friends is incredibly sick. We don't know how much longer he has left. Garland nods understandingly as you explain the urgency of your situation, Tronald, his expression turning to one of concern. After a brief pause, he brightens with an idea. If it's haste you're after, then why don't you take five of our horses? They're not racing standard by any means but we breed them ourselves. I can offer them to you for much cheaper than what you'd pay at a city stable. They're strong, reliable animals, bred to handle the roads around here. They should help you make up some time on your journey. That would be incredible. How much would you want for them? Well, we would usually sell them off at 40 gold each, but for you guys, I'd sell you five of them for 80 gold. Ooh, that's awesome. Yeah, it could really help. No. That just wouldn't work for us, Harland. 
If you'd sell five of them for 200 gold, then we will buy them off you for 200 gold, no less. Ooh, make a persuasion check for me, Tronald. Huh? What? Why does he have to make a persuasion check for that? It's called reverse haggling, Saxy. Have you never heard of it? I was once a master of this. Back before I met you guys, that is. <laughs> right, I bet you were. I was. Don't you believe me? Oh no, I fully believe you, Rar. In fact, I probably believe you more on this than anything else you've ever said. Rar, the master of reverse haggling. Damn, that's only a 13, Joe. All right. I'm afraid I can't do that, Tronald. Best I can do for you is 150. This is so fucking weird. All right, 150 it is. Joe, I'm going to try extra change him with sleight of hand, giving him 17 platinum pieces instead of 15. Ooh, give me a sleight of hand check, buddy. Have we fallen into an alternate universe or something? Because I'm hella confused. God damn it, that's a 12, Joe. As you hand the platinum pieces over, Tronald, Something unexpected happens. He counts them. A stern look begins to spread across his features. It seems like you've given me the wrong amount, Tronald. I'm going to assume it was unintentional. But because of that, I'm afraid I can't give you five horses anymore. You're going to have to take six. Oh, come on, Garland. What the hell am I supposed to do with an extra horse? I don't know. That sounds like a you problem. Garland. I swear to the great green god that if you don't give me five horses, I'll come back here in the dead of night when you're sleeping. I will enter your house and I will fill every single one of your draws with gold. Ooh, give me an intimidation check, Tronald. Finally, that's a 17, Joe. All right, all right. Please calm down. Let's not go to such extremities. I'll give you the five horses for 17 platinum instead of 15. That's what I thought. Garland accepts the 17 platinum pieces and with a nod of appreciation, his rough hands close around the cool metal before he tucks them into the leather pouch at his belt and turns, striding purposefully towards the stables that stand robustly at the edge of the farm. The air is crisp with the scent of hay and the earthy musk of horse as Garland disappears inside the wooden structure. The distant sounds of horses snuffling and the creak of leather fill the air, blending with the rustling leaves and the soft murmurs of farm life continuing around you. After a few minutes, Garland re-emerges, leading five sturdy horses by their reins. Each horse is fully saddled and equipped with saddlebags, ready for a long journey. The saddlebags, made of durable leather, hang from the sides of the saddles, perfect for storing supplies and necessities. Garland has chosen horses that look well-fed and well-groomed, their coats shiny and their eyes bright. These should serve you well. They're strong and steady, bred to endure the long hauls across these lands. Should get you to your destination faster and with less wear on your boots. Once again, thank you all for everything. All right then, Joe. We mount up before kicking off. I want to put Pepe on my horse's head. You know, give him a good view. Let his cheeks feel the breeze as we ride. But I want to make sure he's secure. I don't want any incidents. Saxy gives the signal and one by one, each member of your group hoists themselves up into the saddle. The sturdy horses, freshly equipped and ready, shift slightly under their new burdens, hooves stamping softly against the packed earth of Clearbrook Farm. Rar, with a gentle touch, places Pepe, his pet frog, atop the broad head of his horse, ensuring the small creature is secure and comfortable. With a final nod to Garland and a heartfelt wave goodbye, you all kick off. The horses respond eagerly, their strides picking up as they move away from the safety and familiarity of the farm. Rar's horse takes the lead, and as the group gains speed, the wind begins to whip past, fluttering through your clothes and pressing against Pepe's jowls, causing them to comically flap in the breeze. The scenery around you blurs into a tapestry of vibrant greens and browns as you leave the farm behind. The path ahead winds through rolling fields dotted with wildflowers that sway in the gentle breeze. Beyond, the landscape shifts to thicker woods, the trees standing tall and proud, their leaves whispering secrets of the land. Your horse's hooves beat a steady rhythm on the soft earth, harmonizing with the natural sounds of the countryside. Birds chirp overhead, and somewhere in the distance, a river murmurs its timeless song. Ha! <sighs> you really showed him, Tronald. Thought he could get you down to a cheaper price, didn't he? Well, look who's laughing now. Uh, him? No, Saxy. Us. You'll have to explain the logic behind that one to me at some point, buddy. I mean, it's not too difficult to understand. I was confused at first, but now it all makes sense. I guess when it comes to reverse bartering, you've either got it or you don't, and, well... 
Saxy, it seems like you do not. Yeah, exactly. It's not something one can be taught. It's an innate skill as natural to me and Tronald as the color of our eyes. It's at this point you begin to hear strange noises coming from the saddlebags on the horses. Is that, is that a fucking chicken? No, it's a cocker spaniel. Hmm, that's a strange sounding cocker. I slow my horse to a stop, Joe. I want to look inside these bags. What the hell is going on? Tronald, you pull gently on the reins, signaling your horse to slow and then stop before dismounting. Approaching the source of the noise, you unfasten the straps of the saddlebags with cautious hands, the clucking growing louder and more insistent as you do so. Finally, you open the flap of the bag, and to everyone's surprise, a chicken hops out onto the ground, looking up at you with a curious, beady gaze. Attached to the chicken's leg is a small, rolled-up note. You carefully untie and unfold it, revealing the handwritten message. I win. It seems as though you thought you could intimidate me into giving you a higher price. So I thought I'd give you a little something extra. Her name is Gertrude. Treat her well. That, that, that bastard. He got me. I swear I have a right mind to turn this horse around and deliver him a drive-by platinum piece to the forehead. Or just let Rar eat it. Looks like meat's back on the menu, boys. Huh? You want to eat her? I'd have thought you'd have just added the chicken to your collection of pets. No. God, please, no. Green God, please, yes. I like that idea, Might. I shall keep Gertrude. Damn. Are you going to talk to that one, too? Nah, she's probably feeling a little nervous. You know, strange place, strange people, bald dude asking questions. I think I'll leave it for a little bit, let her settle in. Then I'll approach her when the time is right. Dude, it's a goddamn chicken. Not some hot girl you're eyeing up from across the dance floor. Exactly. There is no reality where chicken is less important than some girl. To be honest, chicken is probably one of the most important things in life. Think about it. Where would we be without them? No more egos, no more nuggies. I wouldn't want to be part of a world without egos and nuggies. The man does like his chicken nuggers. <laughs> Gertrude starts making some strange noises, looking as though she's straining. Uh, I think she's about to poop. Here, you take her, Rar. With pleasure. Hello, Gertrude. My name is Rar. Rar, as Tronald carefully hands you Gertrude the chicken, she quickly settles into your arms. You can feel her warmth and the slight flutter of her heart as she snuggles closer to you, seemingly finding comfort. Just as you're adjusting to her weight and soft feathers, there's a surprising sensation on your arm. Within moments, and with little fuss, Gertrude lays an egg right there, which gently rolls onto your forearm, still warm. I, I pick it up. All right. I look at it for a few moments. Okay. Then I splat it on Alexandru's head. <laughs> Take that, Baldy. Fuck! What's your goddamn problem? Calm down, bro. It's just a prank. Wow. Well, there was absolutely no need for that. But I'm glad you did. It was funny. Joe, I cast Firebolt at Alexandru's head. Let's cook this ego. You do what? Give me an attack roll, Tronald. That's a 19 to hit. Tronald, you step back and begin to conjure your spell. Your hands flicker with a growing light as you summon a small crackling moat of fire. With a dramatic flourish, you release the moat, which zips through the air like a fiery comet aimed directly at Alexandru's egg-drenched head. The impact is immediate and spectacular. The egg explodes in a spectacular burst, scattering partially cooked whites and yolk in all directions. The heat is intense but brief, and when the smoke clears, Alexandru stands there, stunned with his eyes eyebrows singe clean off. Ha! You look like the egg now. I swear to God, you can all go fuck. Eggman! Can you guys leave Eggman alone? We're never going to get to Eggman's temple if we just keep trying to cook food on him. Yeah, Joe, I walk up to Alexandru. Here you go, buddy. This should help wash it off as I pour my water skin over his head. Might, you sympathetically approach Alexandru, water skin in hand, ready to assist in the cleanup effort. You unscrew the cap and gently tilt the water skin, allowing a steady stream of cool water to cascade over Alexandru's egg splattered head. However, Despite Might's best intentions, the water seems to do little more than make the mess wetter, drenching Alexandru in the process. The egg whites and yolk, partially fried onto Alexandru's skin by Tronald's cooking attempt, cling stubbornly to his scalp. Like scrambled eggs stubbornly stuck to a cup that's just come out of the microwave, the bits of egg refuse to wash away, instead becoming a gooey, stubborn mess that adheres even more firmly. On the bright side, at least it's cooled the burn down. Great. Now I'm not only piss wet through, but I still have egg stuck all over me. Can we just get back on the horses and get a move on, guys? I'm not going anywhere with him looking like that. I mean, it's pretty embarrassing. Plus, nobody will take us seriously if they see us. Alexandru, sort yourself out. Clean yourself up. Stop wasting time. We have a long journey ahead of us. What? But I... 
Fuck all of you. Well, that's not very nice, Baldy. You're not very nice. Bitch, I'm adorable. Right. Well, you guys stay here if you want. Enjoy your time with the sun, the chicken, the frog, and each other. I'm making my way back with Alexandru. Come on, man. With pleasure, Saxy. Ha. Huh. Well, looks like we better mount up, Rar. They'd probably be slaughtered by some CR level one bandits or something if we weren't there to protect them. This is true. Let's go. All right. I mount and I ride. After a long and arduous journey on horseback, with each mile stretching out endlessly beneath the steady beat of hooves, you all begin to feel the toll of the ride. The once gentle lope of the horses now sends a jarring reminder through your bodies, aching muscles and sore backs bearing witness to the lengthy travel. Laughter and conversation have long since given way to a weary silence, punctuated only by the occasional shift in the saddle as each of you tries to find a less painful sitting position. As the sun starts its descent, the familiar outline of Alexandru's temple comes into view. You urge your tired steeds forward, their pace quickening with the promise of rest as you draw nearer. Approaching the temple, you are greeted by the large, imposing wooden gates that mark the entrance. The gates stand closed, their heavy timbers a barrier to the peace and sanctuary that lies within. As your group comes to a halt in front of the gates, the sounds of your horses panting and the creak of leather are the only noises in the quiet of the approaching night. So Alexandru, I mean Eggman, do you fancy announcing our arrival so we can get inside? The only thing I'm about to announce is for them to attack on sight. Well, that's just silly. We all know that wouldn't work. They believe in the way of peace after all, silly Eggman. Guys, we're back. Can you open the gates already? Alexandru's voice breaks through the stillness, echoing off the temple walls, stirring birds from their roosts and drawing the attention of unseen watchers behind the gates. For a few tense moments, there's no response. Then gradually, a deep groaning sound fills the air. The heavy wooden gates begin to creak and shudder as they slowly swing open. The massive doors part reluctantly, revealing the familiar courtyard of the temple beyond. Alexandru, as you begin to lead the group through the widening gap, your eyes scan the interior. You don't see Master Shen Tzu. Instead, the courtyard is lined with the faces of other monks. Their expressions are uniformly solemn, the usual peaceful aura of the temple seemingly overshadowed by whatever news or events have transpired in your absence. Where's Master Shenzu? Is he okay? He's not, he hasn't passed, has he? The gathered monks part slightly to allow one of the elders to step forward. You recognize him as Master Liang. He approaches you, Alexandru, placing a reassuring hand on your shoulder. His face is lined with age, and a small, sad smile tugs at the corners of his mouth, softening the worry that lingers in his eyes. No, he has not passed into the realms beyond. Not yet. His voice is low and comforting amidst the quiet murmur of the courtyard. He is very ill, though. You have arrived back just in time. He has been asking about you, you know, relentlessly. I think, I think he has been holding on for you. Please follow me, Alexandru. I will take you to him immediately. Turning, Master Liang leads the way, his robes brushing against the stone pathways of the courtyard. Contrary to your expectations of ascending the usual stairs to the temple's inner sanctums, he guides you around the main building to a beautiful, secluded section that overlooks the sprawling forest and the distant glimmer of the sea. The area is tranquil, the sounds of nature blending with the distant crash of waves, creating a serene atmosphere that feels worlds away from the worries of illness and time. There, in this peaceful overlook, Master Shenzu lies on a bed that has been thoughtfully moved outside, allowing him the comfort of nature's embrace in his frail state. As you approach, something in the atmosphere shifts subtly. Master Shenzu seems to sense your presence. Slowly, he turns his head toward you and his large, turtle eyes light up with a soft glow. A gentle smile spreads across his face, transforming his features with a warmth that radiates a quiet strength despite his evident weakness. Master, father, you look, you look great. I'm sorry I've been away for so long, but we did it. We will no longer face the threat of a goblin attack. And, and we managed to do it peacefully. Ah, dear Alexandru, how the very air shifts with grace upon your return. The sight of you, my child, kindles a joy that lightens the heart of this old man. You have journeyed far and returned with wisdom's glow. And for that, you have swelled my heart with pride. However, I must ponder a curious sight. Why do I behold traces of egg upon your brow? 
Has the simple art of eating eluded you in your time away from our hallowed grounds? Remember, even in the humble act of dining, there lies a lesson to be learned about harmony and intent. No, I wasn't trying to eat it. Rar over there splatted it on my head out of nowhere. Ah, did he now? It seems then that Ra is a good friend indeed, to extend your lessons beyond the conventional path. Such moments, unexpected and lively, are also a vital part of the tapestry of your training. They teach us adaptability and the importance of maintaining composure under surprise, hallmarks of a true master. But, ah, my dear Alexandru, as we share this light-hearted moment, I must confide in you a more solemn truth. The hour approaches for me to embark on a profound journey, the journey into the great beyond. My spirit feels an ever-growing lightness, a gentle lifting, as if the very essence of my being is preparing to ascend to the ethereal realms. This inevitable parting, though bittersweet, is as natural as the cycle of the seasons or the ebb and flow of the tides. Reflect on this, my dear pupil. Let not sorrow cloud your heart, for in every ending there is the whisper of a new beginning. Embrace the lessons we have shared and carry them forward with the same courage and wisdom you have shown thus far. Remember, the true strength of your spirit is not measured by how you wield power, but by how you respond to the impermanence of life with grace and dignity. No, please, not, not yet. Tronal, please, do something. Joe. I walk over to Alexandru, putting my arm around him and pulling him in closely. I'm so sorry, Alexandru. There's nothing I can do. You have made him proud, and pride in one's son is the greatest accomplishment a father could ever hope to achieve. It's at this point Master Shenzu extends a hand towards you, Alexandru, as he struggles to get off the bed, attempting to stand up. I help him, Joe, gripping him tightly. He releases your hand and moves toward the low wall, each step measured and serene. He climbs, ascending gently. There, perched upon the wall, a beacon of wisdom, illuminated softly by the tender glow of the newly risen moon, he lets go of his staff, allowing it to fall to your feet. I kneel down, picking it up softly. I stay kneeled, watching him, as a tear rolls down my cheek. Oh, Alexandru, how your journey unfolds fills my heart with profound pride. Once a boy who harbored such disdain for the world has blossomed into a man whose heart brims with love, an evolution that stirs the deepest joy within me. It was on a night very similar to this, with the moon casting its serene light upon us, that destiny guided you to my side. Your father, a man of great selflessness, was much like you are now, concerned not with himself but wholly with your well-being. Whether he remains on this earthly plane or has ascended to a higher one, if he is no longer with us, together we will watch over you. Together we will look down with immense pride at the extraordinary man you have become. Watch over our temple, Alexandru, for my mantle now rests on your shoulders. Watch over your brothers and sisters Master Bait. As you watch, Master Shenzu begins to transcend the earthly bounds, his form dissolving into ethereal light. Around him, the air shimmers with a gentle radiance as if he is becoming moonlight itself. Slowly, gracefully, his presence unfurls into countless particles, each a whisper of his spirit, floating upwards into the embrace of the night sky. The world around you hushes, bearing witness to this sacred moment as he merges with the infinite, his essence scattering among the stars, forever a part of the universe's vast, serene expanse. Wow, Master Bait, then? I'm, I'm proud of you, man. You've made all of us proud. You will be a great leader, I know you will. Yeah, you could tell how much he loved you. How much he trusted you to wear his mantle with honor and pride. And we love you too, brother. You know that, right? Yeah, I'll be the first to admit it. I'm a bit of a dickhead sometimes, I know that but I'm a dick to all those I love. Yeah, and no matter what you think of yourself, in combat, you're a beast. So then, what's the next chapter for Master Bait? I'm, I've, I've decided I'm going to stay here, guys. My people need me. 
I've loved every second of our journey. From me dying to being against all odds, I love you all and I will never forget you. But my people need me. They need someone to guide us through this new world. Oh, come here you. Joe, I run up to Alexandru, giving him a big hug. Let me get that damn egg off you. Can't have a leader looking like shit. I begin eating the egg off his forehead. I don't try resist, Joe. I just smile. Thanks, Rar. Ah, uh, damn. I feel all emotional. I don't want to cry. Just let it out, Catman. Oh, and guys, I know you're heading into some serious shit. And, and I know that things are going to get messy. Really messy. Just know that when that time comes, that me and the rest of us will be willing to fight, willing to die for our family. Now, Tronald, you are special. Not just because of your connection to Lord Tanavir, but because of your ideals, what you live by. Get out there and find Celestia. Bring her back to you. Make good on your promise. And Tronald, if that Lady Alara or Vizuriel give you any trouble, kick their ass. And I think that's where we will wrap up this session. Andrew, you've been incredible, man. Truly, Alexandria was such a good character. Maybe we can get you back on in the future. Yeah, I'd like that, man. Good luck to all of you. You'll smash it.